Good afternoon. It's really a special treat for me to be here. I travel a lot. Spent two days in Omaha, Nebraska last week, and we'll be in North Carolina next week for two days. Um, but really, being here has been special. Um, it's been special because of the energy, the enthusiasm, the commitment that I've seen when I've been here. It's been inspiring because of the student panel that I saw this morning. And, you know, with students like that, the future looks bright. Um, so I, I commend this school and what it's doing. I commend my, I, I've met Dr. Williams before, but we've really established our family connections that now we are cousins, <laughs> which means I'll be back in Arkansas. <laughs> Many times, no, really, and I, I, I think I, I'm kind of still overwhelmed from having snuck out of the meeting this morning. No disrespect to the next panel, but you know, I'm not sure exactly when I'll be in Arkansas again. So to go to the uh, Clinton Presidential Library, and Bill Clinton has always been one of my heroes, and it is quite an overwhelming emotional experience to go through the library and to hear his voice and to relive uh, some of those moments, and, and I think one of the things that he really does, and I think is very relevant to our conversation today for us, is, is to, to bring out the best in all of us and to inspire all with a sense of hope that things can be better and that we can do better. And I, I kind of got that again just from being there for a little while. So it's just really a, a wonderful experience, and thank you all for coming out today. So my work is primarily on social factors that influence health, uh, as you were told. Um, and to one of the social factors I study is race and race in American society. And to understand race, you have to understand racism and you have to understand the history of race so that, you know, one of the ways in which uh, I primarily work as a researcher, your larger environment shapes you as a researcher, determines which questions you ask and which questions you don't ask. Um, and but I took the assignment seriously to think about what can be done to promote racial healing and equity in the American South. And I will talk more about the research on race and racism in American society more broadly. I usually talk about it in relationship to health. I'll do a little on health but not primarily about health, but just talk about what we know. What have we learned in the last 30 years? Um, some of what I'm going to share with you from the research is going to be uncomfortable and really raise fundamental questions of who we are and how we can rise to become everything we want to be. But let me jump right into the talk since we don't have a lot of time. I don't want to begin from a deficit model. I want to begin to affirm the fact that as a society, we have made enormous progress on the question on race. In fact, in the last several decades, there have been striking increases in the American uh, population in the commitment to racial equality in the United States. And I will give you two illustrations of that, but there's a lot more. I'm drawing from work of Howard Schuman, one of my colleagues at the University of Michigan, one of the country's leading experts on racial attitudes in America. And he published a book. And this book reviews every single question that has been asked in a national study on racial attitudes in America since the 1940s to the present that has been asked at more than one time. So you could look at trend data over time. And here is a question that was first asked in 1963. And the question in a national sample, whites have a right to keep Negroes out of their neighborhoods and Negroes should respect that right. And back in 1963, when that question was asked, 60% of whites in the United States said, yes, whites have a right to do that, and blacks should, in fact, respect that right. So the last time it was asked was in 1996, and you could see only 12% of whites supported that. So that shift is massive if you study attitudes over time, a dramatic decline um, in, in prejudice um, in, in housing. Here is another question, first asked in 1944. White people should have the first chance of any kind of job in the United States. And in 1944, 55% of whites believed in affirmative action for whites and said, yes, whites should have the first chance at any kind of job. It was last asked in 1972, because in 1972, only 3% of whites supported that. And the research thought there's no point in asking it any further. You get no variation on the question. But again, it's another example of dramatic shifts 
in racial attitudes in the United States. I want to give you another example completely different that shows change that has occurred in the United States on the question of race. This is from a study published in 2007 by a professor of communication. And what he looked at, how uh, blacks and Hispanics and Asian models presented in some of the top magazines in the United States and was looking at what roles are they given, are they presented in a positive or favorable light, and how many of them do you even see in these magazine advertisements. And he looked at 1994 and 2004. And what he found is that minority models actually appear more frequently in these magazine ads than the proportion of the population. So, and that's changed. This is different than prior studies, change over time. And that, in fact, they are presented favorably with blacks being presented the most favorably, followed by Asians and Hispanics. And the minority models actually had a higher, I think everyone is being careful, to have a higher rating of favorability uh, depictions. So, and this is contrary to, to earlier studies. So again, I'm saying there's a lot to celebrate. We have made enormous progress. At the same time, when you look at all of the data very carefully, things become a little more complicated. There's something that researchers call the principal implementation gap. And what they mean by that, more Americans support the principle of equality than will support policies to implement it. So let's go back to the first question we saw. Whites have a right to keep blacks out of their neighborhood. And you recall that in 1996, we were down to about 12 or 13 percent um, would say that, which means most are saying, no, blacks should have an equal right to, to, to live anywhere they wanted to. Well. In 1973, a question was asked about implementation. And the question was, if, in fact, there was evidence of discrimination, would you support a law to let homeowners decide, each homeowner decide for himself whether to sell whoever he wanted to sell his house to, even if he preferred not to sell to blacks? So it's a question of, would you support a law that would take away the right from an individual to discriminate and to say, I have this house, but I'm not going to sell it to people of this race. And you would see the gap of people who saying they would support a law. Back in 1973, it's almost 67% of people said they would support a law, much different than those who are uh, supporting the principle. And although the support of the law has gone down, you could see the last time it was asked in 1996, uh, one third of the population are still willing to say, let that person discriminate if he wants to. He has a right to discriminate if he or she wants to. Here's another example. Well, again, I go back to the same question. Whites should have the first chance at any job, and you saw only 3% of whites supported that. This question asks, if there is discrimination in jobs, should a government act to ensure no discrimination in jobs? So would you support government action to ensure that there isn't discrimination? And you see, everybody's supporting the principle, almost 40% when it was first asked in the 60s. Um, um, only 40% would ensure no discrimination. And you can see over time, the number is actually going down. Uh, the question was also asked, or oh, do you not have interest in this issue one way or the other? The people who are sitting on the fence saying, I could care less one way or the other, I don't care whether the government discriminates or not, is actually going up. So what I'm saying is, this is an example of everyone supports the principle of equality, but there's a generally a 20 to 30 percent shortfall of people who would support a policy to implement it. And so researchers thought, OK, maybe the people are just opposed to government action. So they've asked the question different ways, where it's not about what a government does. Americans are not supportive to the same degree of the support, the principle of equality, they're not supportive of, of policies implemented. Um, one of my colleagues at Harvard, Larry Bobo, who studies racial attitudes in America, he calls it laissez-faire racism, mm -hmm. is that um, you can have the equality if you want, if you can, but I have nothing to do with it. I'm not willing to any commitment to, no, really. Um, OK. So what does that mean? Um, we have a long way yet to go. In fact, I'm going to review for you overwhelming scientific evidence 
on the persistence of discrimination in contemporary America. Um, Julian Bond said this just recently, um, on March of this year. The truth is, he said, that Jim Crow may be dead, but racism is alive and well. Why would he say that? Well, here's a CNN poll um, done in 2006 um, that suggests that racism is still a serious problem in America. What this shows you, this is a percent of Americans, blacks and whites, think that racism is a serious problem in the US. 84% of blacks, but even two-thirds of whites, think it's a serious problem. Intriguingly, the national public opinion study asked people, do you personally some know someone who you believe is racist? 43% of blacks said they personally know someone who they think is racist. An even higher percentage of whites say they personally know someone who they think is racist. Do you think that you yourself are racially biased? Very few people, 12% of African Americans, 13%. So everybody knows somebody who's like that, but it's not me. <laughs> Have you been a victim of racial discrimination yourself personally? Half of African Americans said yes, and a quarter of whites said yes. So interesting. What do we actually know from really carefully designed, executed scientific studies? The best kind of work are what are called audit studies. In audit studies, you get people who are equivalent in every dimension. You even judge them of equal attractiveness, you judge them, dress them similarly, and then you send them to do the same task. Um, and the audit studies have been done in the area of housing. HUD has done several studies, 77, 89, 2000. This is from the 2000 study. White home buyers were favored over blacks in 17% of tests. That is, whites were more likely to be able to inspect available homes or to be shown homes in predominantly white neighborhoods are examples of the differences and the experiences. There's also good news and bad news here. Um, these are people of, of equal um, um, attractiveness who are typically are claiming to hold the same job, have the same income, same credit, so everything else is equalized. So one way to think of this means 80% of the time there wasn't a problem. So you can look at the flip side. But still, with everything being equal, 17% of the time there is discrimination. Um, these are examples. Whites receive more information and assistance with financing, more encouragement than comparable blacks. But as they have looked at this in 77, 89, 2000, there is progress. Although it still exists, it's declining over time. Another example are audit studies in employment. Um, Eva Pager was a graduate student at the University of Wisconsin when she conducted, in Madison, when she conducted a study in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. She got two teams of two black males and two white males to apply for 350 entry-level jobs um, in Wisconsin. And she threw a wrinkle into this audit study. The resumes are all identical, but she had one of the African-American males and one of the white males say he had served an 18-month prison sentence for cocaine possession. And what she found as you might expect to find, that if you had, this is the white without a criminal record getting the call back, the white with a criminal record, so there's a difference by race, an African-American with, no with a clean record and white uh, African-American with a criminal record getting back. So you can see within each race, if you had a criminal record, you were less likely to get a call back for a job. The stunning thing in this study that made it to the Wall Street Journal was it was easier for a white male with a felony conviction to get a call back for a job than an African-American male whose record was clean. The resumes were identical. The only thing differed was the hand of the person handing in the, the resume. Deva Pager is now a professor at Princeton University. She's repeated a study in New York City more recently, and this is from a paper published in 2009, her findings from New York City. This is the white felon in New York City getting a call back for a job. This is a Latino male and an African-American male whose record is clean. So evidence of fairly striking discrimination in employment, not in the 1960s, folks. This is 2007, the study was done. There's more evidence that indicates the discrimination is very subtle. Now, some scientists are really creative, and these guys were very creative. What they did they went back to birth records for the last 20 years and looked at the most common names that blacks named their kids and the most common names that whites named their kids. 
and identified names that tended to be more distinctive among whites and more distinctive among African Americans. So distinctively white names were names like Allison, Emily, Brad, and Greg, and distinctively black names were like Letitia, Aisha, Jamal, and Darnell. <laughs> and what they did was to create identical resumes. Resumes identical. There's no race of person handing it in, but they mail these resumes out to 1,300 ads as advertised in Boston and Chicago. And they look to see what response is gotten to the ad. Remember, everything is identical about the resumes. The only thing differs is the name of the applicant on the ad. And what they found was that distinctively white first names produce more favorable results than identical resumes with black first names. In fact, white applicants had to send out 10 applications to get a call back for a job interview. Black applicants, identical resumes, only thing difference is the name, had to send out 15. It's as if employers are using just your name to figure out, are you going to be a good employee or not? By the way, there's research by William Julius Wilson and his students in Metropolitan Chicago where they actually went and interviewed uh, uh, suburban uh, employers in the Metropolitan Chicago area who told them they used the address of an individual to determine whether they would be a good risk or not because the address had to do with the neighborhood where they lived and they could tell from the neighborhood whether this would be a good employee or not. Powerful evidence of the persistence of negative stereotypes in the United States. Discrimination is not only in the big things that happen to individuals like not getting a job or not being, getting a promotion or being stopped, threatened, physically abused by the police, but it's also in the day-to-day -day little things that happen, little indignities. And so back in 1995, while at the University of Michigan, I developed a scale to capture not only the big things, but also the day-to-day -day little things. And it, I called it the everyday discrimination scale. And it asks people questions like in your day-to-day -day life, how often are you treated with less courtesy than others? How often are you treated with less respect than others? How often do people act like you're not smart? How often do you receive poorer service than others in restaurants or stores, and so on? And this today is the most widely used scale now in studies of discrimination and health. And just to give you a sense of what has been found with this, we find that higher levels of discrimination statistically adjusting for taking into account your risk factors for cardiovascular disease and other problems and your socioeconomic status level income and education is predicting disease processes, subclinical disease processes, leading to the more rapid development of coronary heart disease in individuals. Um, so it's been linked not just in the mind, it's not just psychological effects, but to see reactive protein as a measure of inflammation in your body, to coronary artery calcification, that's the development of, of plaque within your arteries, to breast cancer incidence, to fibroids, to carotid artery disease, and to delays of seeking treatment within the healthcare system. The most recent study, well, there were two studies published just last week, week before last, in the American Journal of Epidemiology. Um, that shows higher levels of everyday discrimination predicts higher deposits of abdominal fat. And what was interesting about this study of black and white women, discrimination, everyday discrimination predicts identically among black and white women. Black women have higher levels of everyday discrimination, but it predicts visceral fat and not subcutaneous fat. Now, you don't know what that is unless you're in the medical specialty. Abdominal fat has two types. The type that's really damaging to your health and really predicts higher risk of diabetes and heart disease complication is the visceral fat. And everyday discrimination predicts higher rates of visceral fat in African American and white women who report high levels of everyday discrimination, just published two weeks ago, and suggests that discrimination is a risk factor, the subjective experience is a risk factor that adversely affects health. One of the most striking things in this area in the last 10 years is the spread of studies of discrimination. The early work was on minorities in the United States. There are now studies from Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Brazil, virtually every European country, Western European country, looking at immigrant populations. And all of them find discrimination adversely affects health. I want to give you one example about the power of discrimination in health. In the wake of September 11th, there was well-documented increased harassment and discrimination of Arab Americans in the United States. It tapered off about six months. It's still it, probably on the, on the rise right now. 
Diane Lauderdale, a demographer, went to the birth records in the state of California, and she looked at birth outcomes for women of all racial ethnic groups she could identify during the six-month period before September 11 and the six months after. And she was able to document among Arab American women only in the six months after September 11, there was an increased risk of low birth weight and increased risk of preterm birth. It was not true for black women, white women, American Indian women, Latino women, Asian women in California, only Arab American women. Clear, powerful evidence that the increased hostile environment for the Arab American population was affecting not only their women, but actually their unborn children. And children who were born low birth weight and with increased risk of preterm birth have a higher risk of health problems for the rest of their life. The power of discrimination to adversely affect health and a one additional reason why we need to address it. There's also striking evidence of discrimination in medical care. Um, a, a story that captured the imagination of the news media back in 1999 was work that Kevin Schulman, a professor of medicine, did. He went to a medical conference with physicians and had over 600 physicians give them a little reward, but they sat at a computer, watched a vignette of a patient, and asked them, given the symptoms the patient described, what would you do? All of the patients, unknown to the physicians, were actors. All of them claimed to have the same job or live in the same neighborhood, describe the symptoms in the identical language. They were even trained to have the same facial expression as they described the symptoms. The only thing that differed was some were black and some were white. Some were male and some were female. And what they found was striking. It was on the evening news of every network. And it was that blacks and women were less likely to get the appropriate care. And black women suffered the most because they suffered from the gender bias and the racial bias. Well, Congress, in its wisdom, at the, urge, at the urging of Congressman Jesse Jackson, Jr., asked the Institute of Medicine, the highest scientific medical authority in the country, to commission a study. What happened at that medical convention with these doctors and fake patients? Does that really happen when people enter healthcare context in the United States? And the IOM commissioned a, a panel, um, produced a report published in 2003, entitled Unequal Treatment. This is a press conference, compliments of the Washington Post. I served on the IOM panel, sitting with me at a press conference, uh, Risa Lovisa Murray, currently the president of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the co-chair of the panel, and Dr. Alan Nelson, the former president of the American Medical Association, who was a co-chair of the panel. What did the panel find? We found over 200 published, peer-reviewed scientific studies in the medical literature had addressed the question. And the conclusion was, across virtually every medical intervention, from the most simple procedure, like having a mild TIA, a mild stroke, and getting aspirin, to the most complicated medical procedures, minorities get fewer procedures and poorer quality care than whites. And that occurs even when you look at people treated in the same facility, with the same insurance, with the same level of education, even among patients in the VA system when you would think it wouldn't occur, among inpatients with Medicare when there isn't insurance differences, we find it everywhere. I just want to give you concrete. Let me describe two studies by one researcher, but remember this is a, uh, this is a pattern that exists across the board. Dr. Knox Todd was an emergency room physician at UCLA Medical School. And he asked a really simple question. When a patient comes into the emergency room with a long bone fracture, that's medical speak for a broken bone in the arm or leg. Okay, patient, long bone fracture, pain, right? Broken bone, arm or leg. Is there a difference based on the patient's ethnicity in whether that patient gets pain medication or not? And Dr. Knockstad, reviewing all of the patients treated at UCLA within the prior year, he found that 55% of Hispanic patients did not get pain medication compared to 26% of whites hadn't gotten pain medication. Big difference. 55% Hispanics didn't get it, 26% of whites didn't get it. He's a good researcher. And a good researcher, we worry about something in statistical terms we call confounding. Could it be something else that's driving this? So he statistically took into account whether they spoke English or not, what time they showed up at the ER, how long they spent in the ER, whether they got injured on the job, whether it was so severe they had to be hospitalized, virtually every other potential explanation 
And when he statistically adjusted for all of those factors, the single best predictor of whether a patient could get pain medication was whether they were Hispanic or not. Dr. Todd said, okay, maybe Hispanics have a cultural way of expressing pain that the American doctors are just not cluing in on. So he had a group of patients in pain to rate how much pain they felt they were in. He had a group of physicians to rate how much pain they thought the patients were in and found that doctors could equally detect the severity of pain in Hispanic patients and non-Hispanic patients, but they were describing less pain medication to the Hispanic patients. Dr. Todd moved from UCLA to Emory University in Atlanta, repeated the same study at the three largest emergency rooms in Atlanta, looking at black and white patients and found exactly the same thing. A black person with a broken bone in the arm or leg shows up in the emergency room in Atlanta, is less likely to get pain medication than a white patient. The question, I've just given you the examples of pain. I could talk for the next three hours with examples in cardiovascular diseases where it's been best documented. There are over 90 studies just in the area of heart disease treatment alone. It's, it's, it's everywhere. And the question is, how is that even possible? In the United States of America, with the best trained health workforce, I don't believe that any doctor in this country wakes up in the morning and says, how am I going to get my minority patients today? But how is it possible then, with people with good intentions, aiming to do well, can still produce a pattern of care that is so discriminatory? And we suggested at the time, based on three decades of research by social psychologists, there's a phenomenon that has been well identified that it's not about white people, it's not about Americans, it's not about medical care, it's about how all human beings process information. There's a theories in social psychology about social categorization. To simplify life, we put the sensory information that comes into our mind into different categories. All of us do that. What is interesting and where societies differ is that in our culture, some social categories are valued and some social categories have attached negative information to them. And what the research shows is that if you meet someone from a group, any group, for whom you hold a negative stereotype, my next two words are important. It's unconscious and it's automatic. You will treat that person differently. In other words, you will discriminate against that person. But truly, there was no intent. You didn't even know you're doing it. It's automatic. It's unconscious. We all do it. It's a human phenomenon. What matters, what differs, is who we are, how we were raised, what society we live in, and what are the negative groups we hold as stereotypes. So, for example, let me just push you on this. If you hold negative stereotypes about fat people, about gay people, about old people, about women, it doesn't matter what the group is, about Nigerians, about you know, Italians, if you hold a negative stereotype about a group, and you meet someone from that group without your conscious awareness. Even if you are not personally prejudiced, you will treat that person differently and you will not know that you have done it. And the average physician who I talk to says, I know I'm not racist, I know I don't stereotype. Well, welcome to the human race. Conclusive evidence indicates this happens. The research actually indicates that these, these kind of um, unconscious cognitions are activated more effortlessly and quickly than conscious cognitions and that many cognitive processes result in disconfirmation. That's a fancy way of saying. Our ability to selectively perceive is amazing. You only attend to those things that are consistent with the stereotype that you have. And those that are inconsistent with the stereotype, you see them, but you dismiss them. You don't, they don't really register in your mind. More importantly, 
The research also indicates there are several factors that maximize the chances that this happens. When you're working on the time pressure, when you need to make quick judgments, if the task is complex, if there's a lot, you have a lot of demands on your schedule, if a resource constraints, you're working on the difficult situations, or if there's anger, emotions of anger or anxiety present. All of these factors maximize it. Importantly, many of these factors characterize a typical medical encounter. So medicine would be a particular area where you would expect to see it occur more, more generally. And the point is, this is general about how people um, view information and make sense of things. I'm going to talk about what we can do about this, but I'm trying to walk you through the complexity of the task. <clears throat> because if you misunderstand how serious the task is, you may come up with strategies that will not get at the deep underlying factors. The next set of bad news is that the levels of negative racial stereotyping in the United States are quite high and that these stereotypes drive our behavior. This is a study done in 1990, National Indicator Survey, done by, um, funded by National Science Foundation, done by the University of Chicago, um, found that 44% of whites believe that blacks are lazy, 56% of whites believe that blacks prefer to live off welfare, 51% that blacks are prone to violence, and 29% that blacks are unintelligent. This is this chart showing you how blacks view whites, how whites view blacks compared to how whites view themselves. So while, for example, 56% of whites believe that blacks prefer to live off welfare, only 4% of whites believe that whites prefer to live off welfare. So it's not only that blacks are viewed negatively, they're viewed much more negatively um, than they viewed themselves. This question of stereotype, if you ask in the general public a question about this stereotype, true or false, people will not answer it. But if you, what we do is we ask it on a seven-point scale. Four is neither agree or disagree. And on the one hand, there are three gradations of lazy and three gradations of hardworking, and I'm just collapsing them. They'll, they'll do the gradation part. So I'm looking at the positive end of the stereotypes. And the data here is equally dismal. One in five whites or fewer nationally were willing to say that blacks are hardworking, 17%, prefer to be self-supporting, 13% of whites, not violence-prone, 15% of whites, or intelligent, 20% of whites. So the absence of positive views, positive stereotypes of whites. This is compelling evidence then that we live in a culture where there is enormous negative stereotyping. One of the fascinating things, and I know I'm in a southern state, I'm just reporting the data, these were the groups asked about by the researchers, and the gradation here exists for all five stereotypes. In the interest of time, I'm just showing you one. So I'm showing you what I showed you before. 56% of whites said that blacks prefer to live off welfare. The minority populations asked about were all viewed more negatively than whites, with Hispanics viewed twice as negatively as Asians. So you could see 42% of whites said Hispanics prefer to live off welfare, and 16% of whites said Asians for live of welfare. Jews were viewed more positively than whites in general, and southern whites were viewed more negatively than whites in general. And that pattern and that gradation of negative stereotyping existed on all of the stereotypes. And you'd say, but you're using data from 1990. That was when they asked all the stereotypes. Well, the two of the stereotypes they've repeated since then. Um, and I want to show you the change that has occurred. So this is 1990, percent of whites agreeing that blacks are lazy, you could see 44%. And the question has been asked in multiple years since then, in 2006, the last time, 33%. So from 44% saying blacks are lazy to 2006, the last time, 33%, you'd say we've made progress. However, if you view, look at the positive end of the stereotype, the percent of whites willing to say that blacks are hardworking, 17% in 1990, 16% in 2006, no change. So all the shift has been more people have moved from saying lazy to say neither agree or disagree. People have just sat on the fence, I'm not going to touch this with a 10-foot pole, but they, the positive stereotypes have not changed. I've got to move on here. I had an example of another one, but let me move on. Um, this evidence from a study in Chicago and Detroit um, done in 2004 of high levels of negative stereotyping. I mentioned that yesterday. Um, this is a study where they, they interviewed whites in metropolitan Chicago and Detroit, showed them a 35-second video clip of five different neighborhoods, 
a working class, upper working class, blemish neighborhood, and so on. And then all they did was in the identical neighborhoods, varied the people that were in the picture. So the neighborhood is the same. In some, they had three white residents. Some, they had all black residents, or they had a mix of white and black residents. And what they found is that whites, they had whites rate the dimensions on the cost of property, property upkeep, the safety of the area, the future property value, the quality of schools. Well, they actually could see the property, so they could see the upkeep, so there wasn't any difference on that one. But on all the other measures, whites ranked an all-white neighborhood more positively in terms of the cost of housing, property upkeep, and not property upkeep, cost of housing, safety, future property value, and quality of schools than the identical neighborhoods just if you had one black person evident in the neighborhood. So the presence of one black person shapes the rating provided to the neighborhood. So with that as the background, <laughs> and that as the mountain we have to climb, of how deeply embedded this is in our culture, what can we do? First of all, I believe that community philanthropy needs to play a leadership role in raising awareness levels of the deeply embedded subtle forms of prejudice that are pervasive in our culture but that are unrecognized. Currently, most Americans don't even believe that we have a problem. I, I love this example from the Museum of Tolerance in, in, in Los Angeles, sorry. Visitors to the Museum of Tolerance encounter two doors. One door says, unprejudiced, the other door is for the prejudice. And if you try to go into the unprejudiced door, you'll discover that the door is locked. You can't get into the museum. And a sign flashes on the door that's projected on it that says, think. Stop and think. And now go and use the prejudice door. It's a dramatic way in which the museum is trying to communicate that to a greater or lesser degree, all of us are prejudiced. We have been affected by the culture in which we were raised, and to some degree, we have been affected by the larger stereotypes in our culture. The, the work is, is so discouraging. I just want to give you another study. How we think we would feel and act in response to a racial slur is drastically different from our actual reaction. This is a study published in 2009. They took 120 non-black students, recruited them for an experiment, divided them into three groups. In the first group, these people were in the room, they had these two confederates, they look like other students, but they're confederates of the inexperimental, one's black, one's white. The black guy needs to walk out of the room to pick up his cell phone. While he does that, he accidentally bumps into the white actor's knee while leaving the room. And the white actor responds with one of three options. One, he says nothing, or he says, typical, I hate when black people do that. Or he says, clumsy N-word. So very blatant racism, more subtle, typical, I hate when black people do that, or he doesn't respond. So they look to see what are the responses of individuals because the way the experiment is set up, the black guy comes back in and then the experimenter asks the students there, I need you to work with one of these two guys on this project. So they look to see who's willing to cooperate with this guy in the project. He also assesses their reaction afterwards to the incident. What they find in the two other groups of people one group just watches a video of the incident. They're not in the room, they're not there, they just watch a video. And the other group don't even watch a video, they read a story, a script describing what happened. In the group that watches the video, or that reads the story, most people get upset and think this was blatant racism, shouldn't happen, and 83% of those who watch the video and 75% who read about the racist behavior said they would not choose um, they would choose the black actor, they would not choose the white actor who made this offensive racial slur to work with. Of those people who actually sat in the room and watched it happen, not one per and by the way, all of those people who saw it are upset. Not one person who witnessed the incident report being upset by it. And 71% of those who actually witnessed it said they would work with a white person who was racist. When faced with actual racism, 
people's spontaneous feelings and behavior may reflect latent bias towards blacks. Even people who view themselves as non-prejudiced appear to have unconscious bias that prevents them from confronting races or being upset by racist behavior. So if you take the other two groups as the normal, what people would do, they're randomly assigned to these groups. They said they would be upset. They said they wouldn't do it. But when you put a group in the actual situation, they do nothing. So we have work to do in raising awareness levels. Secondly, community philanthropy needs to take a leadership role in creating a psychosocial environment for the promotion of interracial contact and creating conditions and safe contexts where interracial contact will flourish. Um, interracial contact continues to be uncomfortable and stressful for many. That's what research shows. For both whites and racial minorities, interracial contact is often a source of stress. Whites are often worried about not appearing to be prejudiced, while minorities are frequently concerned that they might be a target of prejudice or discrimination, or that the white person may view them in a stereotypical manner. These concerns, studies show, produce anxiety in interracial um, context. This highlights the need to promote interracial interaction. Um, efforts should be made to create contexts where minorities feel affirmed and safe places where whites feel trusted enough that they don't have to worry about if they misstep, they will be blatantly blamed as being racist. Um, meaningful interracial contact has been shown to be effective at reducing prejudice. However, this is from Gordon Alpert's work 50 years ago. The kind of interracial contact that will reduce prejudice has to have four conditions. It must be among groups that are equal in status. Both groups must have a commitment to a common goal. There must be cooperation among the groups and shared goals. There must be support and encouragement from leadership or persons in authority. In other words, simple superficial contact doesn't do it. What happens, research shows, with simple superficial contact, you tend to view this person that you're associated with as different from the rest of them, but you maintain the negative beliefs about the, them. So you just see your group as different. You're not like the others, but you still maintain the categorical beliefs about the others. Will it work? A recent review by Pettigrew, yes. Interracial contact works to reduce prejudice when the conditions outlined by Allport are met. Importantly, it works not just for racial prejudice, but for prejudice based on ethnicity, on gender, on sexual orientation, on disability, and even on the stigma of mental illness. What else do we need to do? We need to redefine race in American society. We need to have, more, have our culture provide more positive attitudes and positive beliefs about race. We need to get over the historical past. And I'm saying our cultural institutions are still doing that, recent research shows. Negative racial images are so deeply embedded in our minds and they are easily activated and shape our attitudes and behavior. I'll give you two quick examples. The O.J. Simpson case. You remember Time Magazine got into trouble? This is the Time cover page of the, when O.J. Simpson was arrested and this was a Newsweek cover page. Both of them used the identical picture of when he was booked. Time deliberately darkened the picture because in our culture, Darker colors are associated with more negative attributes. In time, eventually, they were caught because Newsweek covered the same picture and you could see the difference. Uh, Newsweek had to, um, time had to apologize. Well, researchers did a fascinating study. They took pictures of candidate Obama, darkened some and lightened some. Digitally darkened some pictures and lightened some pictures. And as a sample of Americans to think, which picture showed them three pictures? A normal picture of Obama, one that was lightened, one that was darkened, and I asked them to say, which picture you think of these three is more representative of Obama? <laughs> People who were liberal, who tended to support where Obama was coming from, said the lightened picture of him was what he really looked like. People who tended to be more conservative, who tended to be opposed to Obama, said the darkened picture of Obama was what he really looked like. And importantly, even after statistically adjusting for your political party preference and your ID and all the factors, if you picked a lightened picture of Obama as representative, you were more likely to vote for him seven days later. That they, 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 the study was done seven days before the election, and they re-interviewed people after the election to see who they had voted for. 
So the subtle color coding that you picked actually shaped your behavior in voting. They actually tried lightning and darkening McCain. No effect. No impact. The point I am making is as we try to address the problem, we have to recognize that the media can have a huge impact. The media can affect our emotions and the degree of empathy we feel towards groups. Societal-wide reductions in prejudice, stereotypes, and discrimination will require large-scale adoption and implementation of strategies to alter these deeply embedded cultural beliefs about race. We'll need to find ways to provide incentives so that leaders across multiple institutions in our society will make improvements in tolerance and changing the, the fundamental beliefs and values about race a priority and an issue that's central to their mission. There's a study that holds a little promise, also shows some challenge. There have been few studies that have tried to actually intervene on the media and see if the media can actually change prejudice. One small study that was recently published in 2009 went to the country of Rwanda, which had a huge um, massacre of, of, of Tutsis, a numerical minority who had controlled power. And for one year, they created a soap opera in Rwanda and had one group see this soap opera where they used drama and humor and popular problems and traditional songs to teach about the ethnic conflict and to teach about tolerance and to teach about prejudice and to teach about violence. And what they found, they had a control group, so very well elegantly designed, a control group saw a similar soap opera but about health. So one was about prejudice and ethnic conflict, the other one was about health. So they compared these two groups over time. And what they found, instructively, it did not change the individual prejudice and beliefs that individuals had. However, it changed their behavior. They were more open to interracial marriage between Hutus and Tutsis afterwards. They were more willing to cooperate with members of the other uh, tribal group. They were more willing to speak up if something was said and done that was racist. So although, interestingly, their beliefs and prejudice didn't change, their actual behaviors changed around it. But I also want to say it wasn't a huge change. They moved from being statistically significant, from 50% being opposed to, um, to um, interracial marriage, to 40%. So it was a 10 percentage difference. But it's one of the few scientific examples that the media, and just being exposed to the media, I mean, there was no preaching, there was no explicit teaching, but just this, the act of this in the soap opera and the messages came through actually shaped behavior. We need to find ways to do it better. And finally, uh, yesterday I talked about institutional racism. We need, philanthropy needs to educate our leadership across society about institutional racism and find ways to address it. What is needed? I leave you with these words of Senator Robert Kennedy. Remarks he made the evening that Martin Luther King was shot. And I think those words still re resonate to me and ring true for all of us. What we need in the United States, Senator Kennedy said, is not division. What we need in the United States is not hatred. What we need in the United States is not violence and lawlessness. What we need is love and wisdom and compassion toward one another and a feeling of justice toward those who still suffer within our country whether they be white or whether they be black. I hope that all of you here today would commit your lives to this need and to work together to produce greater racial healing in the United States of America. Thank you. I went a little long, but I think we have time for questions. We do. Questions. For those uh, uh, that can stay, we do have time for some questions. So please raise your hands and wait for the microphone to get to you if you have any questions. Yes, sir. Fernando. Uh, my name is Fernando Cruz. I'm a student here at the school. And Dr. Williams, thank Mr. you President. very much. <laughs>
Thank you again very much for being here. Uh, you and Chancellor Anderson before you have been phenomenal uh, people for us and for our community and we really appreciate your presence. You. Uh, my question is, earlier in your talk you talked about how it seems like it's human behavior, it's human nature to have uh, certain tendencies for racism um, or for discrimination. For group the... categorization. It's, 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 it's as Sorry. soon as we can identify ourselves as a group as opposed to another group, feelings of in-group favoritism and out-group discrimination be developed. So it's not always about race. It's, it, that varies by society and place. Yes. Sure, so, so I guess the progress that you began your talk talking about, the, the progress that we have made and the progress that you hope and we all hope we can continue to make, is that, what is that? Is that just redefining things? Is that just culturally making things more appropriate? Can we ever get to a point where we truly are a society that has no bias against any, no discrimination against any group? We can. Um, um, there's actually a whole body of research, um, and I haven't talked about some of the specific strategies, but if, if someone wants to look this up, um, Michelle Van Ryn, R-Y-N, um, at the University of Minnesota, um, uh, Jack DeVidio um, um, at Yale University uh, are examples of researchers who are specifically doing this. In fact, I can give an, a commercial now. Um, the, there is a journal published out of Harvard called the Du Bois Review. The issue that will be out any day this month um, is a special issue that I guess edited with um, Dr. David Takeuchi from the University of Washington on racial inequality in the United States. And that issue has an excellent paper by Michelle Van Ryn, Jack DeVitti, that entire team, Susan Fisk, on the question of what we can do about racial, reducing racial prejudice, specifically in the area of medicine. But what applies to medicine applies in general. So just to give you some concrete examples, um, certainly addressing the problem begins with a recognition that we are vulnerable. If I live life thinking, I would never do that. I have set up myself to do it. So I first have to realize that could be me. I could be those doctors that Dr. Todd studied. Okay? So I have to realize that it's, it's possible for me to do it. And then the research suggests several strategies that, that, that can counter it. One is called individuation as opposed to categorization that you deliberately, consciously, if you're a physician and the next patient comes in, before that patient comes in, remind yourself, I'm going to view this person as an individual. Not as a white male, not as an Asian female, not as a black, you know, I'm going to view this person. So individuation does it. Another strategy that works is what's called counter-stereotyping. If you know you view women as weak, then try to imagine a strong woman. Another strategy that works is um, perspective taken. As you see this person comes in and they belong to a group that you tend to negatively stereotype, imagine for yourself, think through, what must life be like in their shoes? So this older African-American male, what must it life be like for him? as an older African-American male and the experiences he has gone through in his life. And these are some of the strategies that have been shown in, in rigorous empirical research to reduce the likelihood of the unconscious discrimination. But the other thing they said, you have to have time, you have to have motivation. Again, it, it's more likely to occur if you're under high stress. So stress management strategies is actually a part of, of you know, under high stress, you, you revert to just unconsciously how you would normally respond. Yes, sir. Uh, back in the back, Bill. Hello, my name is Heath Kerlock. A pleasure to have you here. And I saw your quote, uh, Senator Robert Kennedy. He actually said that right after he quoted Aeschylus. And he once wrote, even in our sleep, pain we cannot forget, falls drop by drop upon the heart until in our own great despair against our will comes wisdom through the awful grace of God. And so I have high respect for that quote you use. One thing you didn't mention today was the role of healthy marriages. And what role can, do healthy marriages have in reducing racism? Uh, I firmly believe that the role of healthy marriages can reduce racism in the United States. And I would like to know what you have to say to that. Interesting idea. Um, 
I am not personally aware of any research showing a relationship between the quality of marriage and racism discrimination. Um, I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I'm not aware of it. Um, I, I don't think that healthy marriage per se, because marriage has to do with your relationship between two people, generically <clears throat> will lead, I mean, healthy marriage is good for health. I, I could talk about that. I mean, married people live better than, live longer, have, have better health than, 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 than single, than especially than um, formerly married people. The married really do better than the formerly married and widowed and divorced. Um, some studies find they do better than single, some don't. Um, and part of the reason we understand um, men benefit more from marriage than women do because women are a driver of the benefits that men receive from marriage. Women structure men's lives and get them to follow through on the doctors and ensure they have regular meals. No, I mean, really, this is all men studied. Marriage is a powerful predictor of variation. If you look at the in national mortality data, the gap in health between, between the married and unmarried is almost as big as some of the other gaps we study. There's a huge disparity by marriage. So marriage is good for health. Um, I certainly think that a healthy marriage with awareness raising could become a powerful team to work towards it, but I don't know that it's automatic. That's, that's what I would say. Yes, sir. Right here, Dr. Burr. The city of Little Rock has a racial cultural diversity commission that is charged with dismantling racism in the city. What would be the number one thing you think that commission should focus on to actually help dismantle racism? It's a good question. I I'm not sure would be my answer. Um, I think one of the things we need to do is to build on the goodwill that we have. The changes in racial attitudes that I showed you are really important because they provide a foundation. Um, we have moved from a society where racism was celebrated, racial prejudice was celebrated and was regarded as just the way things were to a society where everyone endorses the norms of equality. Although, partly what I'm saying is the commitment to those norms are superficial, but everyone endorses the norms of equality. One of the worst things you can do to uh, an American adult is to say you are racist. No one wants to be called a racist. So it, it says that, uh, some of my students <laughs> tell me, you know, that the, the discount that changes in racial attitudes and said it's just people are just saying the right thing. I said, well, even if they're saying the right thing, even that's changed because 50 years ago they weren't saying the right thing. So even that's changed and it says the norms have changed. And that is changed. So I do think we have to build on the norms. Probably, the, one of the big challenges is one of the things I said it needs to be done. The average American defines racism as what happened in Jasper, Texas, where those four men tied this black male to a pickup and dragged him for miles to his death. And they would never do that. Um, and the evidence I just shared with you today about the prevalence of unconscious, unthinking discrimination is something that most people are unaware of. The fact that I am a prejudiced person, and, and I, I'm aware of that, and I try to be aware of it, um, is important. And it, it's, it's the beginning for me to make steps to address the problem. We cannot deal with it in a, in a way of condemning others. I mean, all people are doing are, are being human in terms of responding to the deeply embedded messages in our cultures. The TV shows, I, I, the research shows that the, the, you, you, if you raise, that's why I'm saying racism is as natural as breathing, I tell my students. If you raise in this society, it's there. And you have to be aware of that and consciously take steps to fight against it. I think you want to work with the community, you want to work sensitively with the community, um, and, and you want to raise awareness levels so people understand this in a context where they feel safe. And I think the, my point of creating those safe places, um, we tend not to talk about race. Or, and then something happens and we have a shouting match. And how do we have places where we can begin to learn to trust 
and honestly share and begin to develop the understanding that we need is a challenge. I don't think there's any magic solution, um, but there are examples. Honestly, the report I heard this morning from the students from this school who went to a neighboring community, worked with that community college, and what they were able to do is, is a wonderful model of change. And, and I think they emphasize the role of collaboration, the role of not coming in and superimposing what you wanted, but, but of helping people to begin the dialogue and to take ownership for it. But I think we have to do that. It's not going to happen on its own. We have time for one more question. P. Banks. Dr. Williams, thank you so much for being here today. Um, you talk about discrimination as being this uh, subtle thing at times, and I wanted to share a fact with you, which I'm, I'm almost certain you already know, and that is that you can determine a child, or you can determine whether a child will graduate from high school, you can determine a child's ACT and SAT score, you can even determine if a child will go to prison or not simply based on their zip code. And it's a huge issue with education in this country. Um, when, we talk about, uh, when we talk about your strategies about how to solve the issue, um, and, and when I, I'd like to bring up the point that, you know, yesterday at the race summit you talked about how a lot of times people don't make decisions based on logic more so than they do on emotion. When we talk about a blatant issue like that, something that everybody sees, uh, but, few pe but people really struggle to address, how do we use the steps and the strategies you, su you suggested today to begin to solve that problem? Okay, a, a great question. So yesterday I talked about institutional racism and the role of segregation, and segregation certainly drives access to educational opportunity. So you're absolutely right. You'd notice my last slide of what community philanthropy has to do, has to address the institutional racism, so I agree with you, that's fundamental. I also want to make it clear that although I have focused on kind of the subtle unconscious discrimination, there is discrimination that is not subtle and is not unconscious. So I, I'm not trying to say that all the discrimination is. I think the bulk of it is. I, I think the, those persons who are deliberately are a, a, a minority of the U.S. population. On, on, on the order of less than 20%, generally studies find it's 10 to 15% of people that, that would fall into the category of being blatantly racist, proud of it, will discriminate, could care less. It's that, that exists and that still exists, but that's not, that's not the driver of the problem. The bigger problem we have are people in the middle, people of goodwill, who mean well, who don't harbor consciously a negative thought. But like the physicians that, do, I, I mean, don't have a consciously a negative thought, but are shaped subtly by these larger negative images in the culture and act in those ways. So yes, we do have to address the fundamental problems of, of, of institutional racism. We, we, we need to give every American child a shot at the American dream. We need to find ways there is a, a, a head of the criminal justice department in one state says he can predict the need for prison beds, prison cells in his state by looking at third grade math and English scores. Because 80% of prison inmates in the U.S. are high school dropouts. One of the things I do in my spare time, I'll give a commercial for a wonderful organization. Just saw Pat, uh, Pastor Wendley Phipps, he's singing for President Clinton in the library. Um, it's Wintley Phipps, a uh, good friend of mine, I sit on his board, runs an organization called the U.S. Dream Academy. And what it is trying to do is to break the cycle of violence. It's estimated today that 70% of the crime in the future in the United States will be committed by the children of prisoners. Because their parents are high school dropouts themselves with a criminal record. They're living in disadvantaged communities, going to segregated schools. What's their options in life? And so what we're doing is establishing the US Dream Academy, rigorous tests and evaluation of where those kids are weak, and then developing a tailored curriculum to ensuring their success in the area where they're weak, and combine that academic enrichment with mentoring and values training, and that we are trying to break the cycle of violence. And I don't think we have the magic solution. We've gotten enormous support from President Bush and President Clinton and Newt Gingrich and Oprah and so on. 
Um, but we need to replicate that model and, and, and more fundamentally address the fundamental challenge in education. By the way, let me tell you about another resource, and this, this is pre-Obama, but it's a report produced by um, the, um, blocking on the name, it's the Education Outfit in DC, I'm blocking on the name, but the report is called Yes, We Can. And it was published in 2005, you can get a PDF online. And it is strategies that can be used to produce successful kids in the United States, irrespective of the neighborhood in which they are being raised. And it points out examples of schools in, on poor American Indian reservations, in poor black communities, in poor Latino communities that are doing among the best in their state in terms of turning uh, outcomes for kids. And what it finds is that the single biggest predictor of academic performance in the United States is not school size, is not actually even the money spent on school, is teacher quality. And the problem we have is that the kids who need the most help don't get the best teachers. And so we, we, we actually know what it takes to be successful. I go back to where I ended yesterday. We need awareness and political will to do the right thing by our kids. God bless you. Ladies Thank and you gentlemen, so Dr. David Williams.